Mm, that is a really <laughs> big question. It's a really big question because if you, it, and it depends on what perspective you take. So for example, if you come from an Aristotelian perspective, as I do, then um, wisdom could be a part of virtue or it could be a way of life that exemplifies flourishing. Um, so there's a little bit of complexity here. So you could say that Aristotle has two conceptions of virtue, intellectual virtues or virtues of thought, and virtues of character or moral virtues. And so practical wisdom, or phronesis, is integral to moral virtues, and practical wisdom is how we reason about what to do in the world, how we act virtuously. Now, if you go with that conception of virtue, then practical wisdom is necessary to achieve flourishing, considered as a life of virtuous activity in the polis. Now, if you go with the other conception of virtue, virtues of thought, or intellectual virtues, then there is a different kind of wisdom that is available to us eventually, and that is contemplation. The life of contemplation is an alternative to the life of virtuous activity in the polis. So that's just one tradition of thought about virtue and wisdom. There are other traditions, such as Buddhism, which maintain that uh, wisdom is something that one achieves through meditation, mindfulness, the practice and cultivation of Buddhist virtues such as compassion and loving kindness. Well, it's an interesting question. I suppose that I feel more, most in intellectually at home in the Aristotelian perspective because I've done most work in it. Um, but I really think Buddhism has a lot to offer, and I come to that tradition as a learner. So, of course, I come to the Aristotelian tradition as a learner, too. It's just that I, th I think I know a little more of it than I do of Buddhism. I would also throw Confucianism into the mix here, too. Confucians uh, hold that uh, there are really three stages of moral development, and the third of which is the sage. So that's a very high level of moral development, and at that level, we achieve virtue, or the, the select few who get, or sorry, the, the select few who get there achieve wisdom. But it's through being virtuous that you get there. And I think these Eastern traditions, both Buddhism and Confucianism, have a lot to offer that Western perspectives sometimes leave out. So for example, in Aristotle, you find a lot about being habituated into virtue through repeatedly performing actions and actualizing our potential. And for Buddhism, it's a little bit different. There's more of an emphasis on mindfulness. In Confucianism, there's an emphasis on ritual, which is intended to instill in us certain states of mind. And all of that is very, um, very hospitable to a wisdom-oriented perspective. Social intelligence is, is basically something like people smarts. You know, it's the ability to read people, to know about people, to be able to navigate the social world and to function in social settings. And wisdom is not just social intelligence, although I think certain forms of wisdom rely on certain forms of social intelligence. So as I see the two, I would see social intelligence as possibly a precursor to certain forms of wisdom, namely wisdom in dealing with people and their problems, uh, their lives, their situations. I think in order to be good in terms of social intelligence, you have to have empathy, which is closely related to compassion. Right, so empathy is a sort of feeling with another, and compassion is a feeling for another, as I conceptualize them. And so I think in terms of being um, adept with social intelligence, you do need to have empathy. You need to have something closely related to compassion. And that without that, you're not going to have this perspective needed for wisdom. So for wisdom, I think you need a broader perspective than just yourself or even the persons with whom you immediately interact. You've got to broaden your perspective and compassion, the enabling one to put oneself in the other's place and identify with what the other is going through is essential for that. <laughs> Depends on what aspect of those topics you want to address. Um, I think in terms of wisdom, uh, I think that um, really if you want to look to Eastern traditions, the Dhammapada of the Buddha is very useful. Um, 
uh, the Upanishads of the Hindu tradition, very useful. Bhagavad Gita, again, very useful. Um, the Analects of Confucius is a great place to, to look for resources on wisdom. And that's, that's not part of the psychological literature on wisdom. I think Robert Sternberg has wit written on wisdom, and that's very useful also. But in terms of the great traditions, uh, I would say those are some very good resources for Eastern traditions. Um, Taoism, too, presents some pretty interesting resources. So the Tao Te Ching and the Tuangzi uh, are very interesting resources from Taoism. Now, the, the reason that those are so interesting is a reason why Zen Buddhism is also interesting, and that is because those texts often present paradoxes to the Western mind. And we're used to running around so linearly and in such a great fashion, and then these paradoxes bring us up short in terms of what we're doing and stop us from thinking and force us to take on a different kind of perspective or framework. And that's what makes them interesting. They invite us into an alternative form of consciousness. So those are resources that I would suggest. Now in my review, I wasn't thinking of those because I wasn't really thinking of wisdom research. I was thinking more of research on virtue and I was also thinking in terms of, say, say, some neuroscientific studies that have been done that could be relevant to virtue. And here I, I like the work of Kevin Oaksner very much on cognitive upregulation and downregulation of emotions because emotional regulation is such an important part of virtue. So I'd say that that's a good uh, resource for uh, studying virtue, although it's kind of, uh, you know, what I'd say downstream from virtue studies. Um, and that's very, a very helpful way of looking at things. Uh, Peterson and Seligman have done some work on the values in action uh, series, and they've done some work on virtue, which is also very interesting. So there's some psychological material out there that's, that's definitely worth considering. I had a very interesting experience a couple of weeks ago at the University of Minnesota. I was invited to come with a colleague from the psychology department uh, from Wake Forest University. And we, we uh, gave some presentations on virtue. Um, he gave a psychological perspective. I gave the perspective of a philosopher whose work has been informed by psychology. And part of that was to speak to um, a freshman class. So there were teachers who were team teaching, and one of them was Valerie Tiberius, who's a, a philosopher who's done work on wisdom. And, um, and they had a large group of freshmen that they had been teaching in a special seminar all semester. They had given them um, my work, uh, Aranda's work. They had given them the full texts of these things, and they were just on it. So my view is that you shouldn't hold back. You shouldn't try to dumb things down for young people. Give them the full text, let them encounter it, try to help them through it, let them have the, uh, let them have the Nicomachean ethics and the Analects of Confucius and Taoism and uh, Buddhism and uh, the wisdom research in psychology. Let them look at it and struggle with it and chew on it and get the full flavor of what the great minds have to offer. You know, I'm not black, right? So I don't have the internal perspective. I don't have the perspective of someone who has indeed been oppressed in the same way that blacks do. But just to, I, and I, I do know black men. I have friends who are African American. Um, there is a great fear of blackness in our culture. And I think the fear of blackness goes beyond just the fear of other minorities. I think there is something really deep-seated in the culture, perhaps going back to slavery, you know, perhaps tapping into something else. But you know, we have a history in this culture of really bad treatment of African Americans. And the article that I wrote was a complex article in which I tried to identify the misuse of various virtues in oppressing uh, blacks during the, the slave culture of the South, in the slave culture of the South. So, you know, you'd have preachers saying uh, the virtues of a good black servant are obedience, right? Humility, 
that sort of thing. So those are the virtues of submissiveness. And then in uh, the development of the African American response, which took place through uh, civic organizations, through people like W.E.B. Du Bois and um, uh, Booker T. Washington, right, and others, uh, there emerged what uh, someone has called a, and I can't remember the guy's name who wrote this book, unfortunately, that I used, uh, the African American virtue tradition, right? And the, the virtues that you expressed were part of that. But they're the virtues that are needed to survive and carve out an identity in the face of a very hostile society, right? So prudence, meaning you have to know, you have to watch out for what you're doing, you have to time what you do and what you say. Fortitude, you have to have endurance. Courage, you just can't buckle under. And then the, uh, what was the other one? Justice. Thank, well, yeah, justice, but I don't think I had that on the list, right? right. Or maybe I did. I, yeah. But justice, is uh, you have to have a sense of justice, a sense when you're wronged, and a sense that you are worth enough to step up and say, no, you can't do this to me. And it takes a long time, too. So the idea is that the development of these virtues in black culture in the African American community is here for the long haul, right? And you have then more recently in the 60s, you have various other approaches to dealing with this. So you have Martin Luther King Jr. who um, was inspired by Gandhi, right? And nonviolent resistance was added to all of this. Then you had Malcolm X very different take on things. So black culture is really complex, and not being immersed in it, I can't really say whether these virtues have a place. But I would be surprised if they don't. And what you have to look at now are things like what's going on in Ferguson, Missouri, which calls up a panoply of these virtues in face of ongoing abuse by the police. I was talking about this just the other day with a student of mine who's writing a term paper on something similar to this topic. I mean, you want virtues that are uh, what, what you might call for all seasons, right? You want virtues that will enable you to overcome oppression and then go beyond that to flourish and thrive. And I think these are the ones, right? Because prudence isn't just going to help you overcome a situation of oppression. It's going to help you to create yourself anew, to form the new identity, to form the new society. And you know, to form yourself not in opposition to the oppression that once was, but in your own right, right? So I could see this, this sort of thing in terms of a social virtue development, uh, where you know, a, a culture such as a black culture emerges in the face of oppression and overcomes it and then as we go through time, creates a new identity, creating themselves anew. And I think you can see that in uh, the history of names of uh, African Americans. So at the beginning, when, when African Americans were slaves, some of them were named after barnyard animals, for example. Uh, the height of degradation. And then they were named after their masters, right? And so eventually you find in the African American community a creation of completely new names, different types of names, names we don't find in white culture. And what is this doing by creating yourself anew, not replicating that which was foisted on you?